Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon everybody. It's an honor to be presenting here. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about partitioning FPGA optimized systolic array for fun and profit. Um, well, over the few days in the conference, we heard a lot about machine learning. There's a lot of amazing use for them. Uh, well, you can do optical character organization. You can do real-time object detection. This is from a YOLO demo. And you can have a lot of voice recognition usage. Uh, but today here, we're gonna talk about the hardware that actually supports all these amazing applications. So uh, this is NVIDIA Tesla V100, uh, which is their uh, AI chip for the use. Um, this is the Google Cloud uh, TensorFlow processing unit, which actually follow a systolic array design to make the ASIC, and they have been increasingly making a lot, a lot more of them to support their huge data center. And Microsoft Framework Project, they actually use one of the FPGA chips on the, to support the AI platform. Um, so our claim here today is we're going to talk about what about FPGA, how can we do that? and also how to improve the utilization rates of FPGA systolic array. We use evolution strategy to do the main optimization. We can generate a design that boosts your throughput gain in a matter of seconds. And in the end, we will talk about some completion and we are 1.3 to 1.5 times higher throughput than the state-of-the-art design. So, Uh, so let's talk about the systolic array. So systolic array is basically a hardware configuration that pack a bunch of discrete processor you need in uh, array configuration. They allow nearest neighbor communication, and this is one of the really uh, big reasons why they can allow a lot of data reuse. And it's actually a decade old design that have been now really popular on doing convolution neural network. And it just allow a high utilization of FPGA chips, like the hardware results on FPGA. And because they have the column arrangement as you can see on the slides, they are really suitable for FPGA chips. So one of the really high level abstraction usage is when you want to do a dot product between two matrix, uh, like say matrix B and A, and you want to achieve matrix C. Uh, with a systolic array, what you can basically do is you can fed matrix A from the top to the bottom and the other matrix from the left to the right. And each of those white uh, squares is basically a uh, multiplication and accum accumulation unit. And after you just basically pass the data flow between them, you will already have matrix C, the result in place. And this is one of the reasons why we think uh, system like array is really good. Not only us, Silence actually have a paper on super tile. And they actually designed this FPGA accelerators, which has four processing units. As you can see here, the first three processing units is convolution processors, and the last one is actually a processor solely for doing fully connected layers. And I, I, I remember most of them actually use some sort of systolic array design. So scaling the test here is actually a paper published by my professor, which is a slightly different way to do systolic array. Uh, it's also used the uh, Silence Ultra Scale family, but the major difference is it's utilized the URAM, BRAM, and the B DSP blocks, and also the data flow in movement between them in a cascade fashion. So what happened here is in the end, um, the systolic array design here in that paper is a nine to 1920 systolic array. You may be wondering why it's like a really narrow rectangular systolic array. The reason behind is the dimension nine there is actually uh, nine DSP blocks in a single row. And the reason why they choose nine DSP block is because uh, a free time free convolution works really well using nine DSP block and it's really great for a lot of machine learning application. So when we want to talk about systolic away performance, we majorly focus on their latency and their throughput. So a really basic uh, evaluation on how systolic away work is Imagine you have a convolution neural network. You basically map each layer of the network to the systolic array, and they take turns to be computed. So on the slides here, you can see Google Net, which is a really popular neural net, convolution neural network. Uh, what, they, what this graph show is the number of operations per layer in this graph. So what we want to do here is we're gonna map this into the systolic array. 
in the way of mapping this historic array, for the time's sake, I'm gonna just use the first three layer as a representation. So you have all these operations from the first three layers, and you basically match each of them into the full systolic array. And in the end, what you can achieve and see on the right hand side is the height of those rectangles actually represent the amounts of time cycles you need take to um, finish the calculation on those layers. So the way you calculate the latency in this kind of situation is actually just sum of them up. And the full pool is just one over latency. That's no, not really a hard problem. So in our experiment, we find out that it's around 4 milliseconds, and the throughput is around 200 millimeters per second. So this is the baseline. So it's called full, I call it fully mapped because I think this represents each layer is fully mapped to the systolic array, which is a really good starting point, but we can do better. So one of the problem why this have a huge problem is, is you look at this graph is, this is a graph about the utilization. Basically, on the x-axis, you have how many arrays uh, or how many resources we are throwing into the, to in the layer. And on the left-hand side is the amount of cycle you take. And on the right-hand side is the amount of array being idle. So in this case, we only picked the first layer of Google Net. Uh, what happened here is actually, as you put more and more layers into it, definitely you get a significant improvement. You take less cycles to complete it. However, you also have a higher and higher array idle percentage, which means we can actually just bury those array into other layers, right? So that's exactly what we do. This is the next step to take. And what we do is we basically allow all the layers to take uh, equal partitions of the hardware resource. And what in the end happen is, um, let's say I have three image of cats I have to process. In this case, it's kind of look like data pipelining. So when the first image go onto the first layer, um, it will use that part of the resource. But afterwards, uh, once it's done the first layer, you can fed the second image onto the first layer, and then so on and so on. And this is kind of a data pipelining idea here. Um, and what in the end is you also have the amount of cycles um, calculated. And the way you evaluate the latency of this kind of design is actually still summing all of them up. However, the key point being here is the throughput is actually different. The throughput now is just one over the slowest partition in this case, which means the slowest layer, which means the green rectangle. So in our case, we achieve a 10 millisecond latency and a 500 millisecond, uh, 500 millimeters per second, which is slightly better, but you don't gain a lot because you have a higher latency penalty and a higher throughput. So what we want to do next is, if you look at this graph, you can clearly see that there is different amounts of work across layers. So why should all the layers get the same amount of hardware results, right? So what we end up doing is, instead of giving them an equal partition on the systolic array, we uh, give them an amount of resource according to their operation counts. Um, the pro and here is basically it's the same. You still have the three same cat image you fed them to it. And then the latency is still the sum of the latency. But in this graph, you can see the amount of time you need to count the layer finishing is actually way more balanced. That means when you calculate the throughput, it's actually way better than before. So in the end here, you can see that the latency is around 10 milliseconds, but we have a way higher throughput gain. So if you see this from a graph perspective, what it's saying is that you basically pay no latency penalty, but gain a way higher throughput gain. Uh, the problem here is that even though even though this sounds already good enough, the problem is a lot of new new convolution uh, layer uh, neural network actually is not you cannot just determine how to partition it by the amount of operation and some layer is not really that scalable. Another question I want to ask is yeah, Google Net have 58 layers. Do we want 58 partitions? Uh, we don't want that, so we reduce the amount of partition by grouping layers together. Now, instead of having each layer as their own partition, what we can do is each partition contain more than one layers, and this is the grouping. So what's going to happen is uh, we're going to fed them into the systolic array, and we're still going to assign the hardware resource on them. But at this time, it's kind of hard to determine what hardware resources should we assign to. Like, because each partition, it can contain 20 layers, but like with fairly minimal operation count and otherwise, so it become a problem. 
But with our tool, the tool that this paper concluded, we can achieve even higher throughput gain with minimum latency penalty. So the three major questions, research question we're talking about here is, how many partitions should we have? Uh, how many hardware resources should each partition have? And how many layers should each partition get? And actually, as I said before, the last two questions is actually an entangled choice. So as illustrated in the slides, actually, if you have different layer assignment, you have to kind of assign your resource differently. And if you put more resource to one partition, you may want to put more layers to be computed in that partition. So this is the difficulty, and we think a naive approach is not enough. So the agenda today is we're going to talk about briefly about the problem formulation. We're going to talk about the workflow. We're going to result, demonstrate some of our results, and we're going to talk about the impact and the future. So uh, the problem layer framework you can see is on the left hand side is uh, what we call a layer assignment. On the right hand side is what we call a resource assignment, which is represented by LX and PX. And X is actually the index of the partition. And a really, uh, if you're in like programming, you kind of know this is just an array. And this just represents the first two layers is in the layer assignment of the first partition. And then the first partition also gets 504 resource. So there's a limitation. You cannot go over the overall network you can assign to. And then you can, because our research actually based on the scaling the Cassidy paper, our resource, total amount of resource cannot go more than 1,920 rows of systolic array. So we know that given a layer assignment, and given a specific resource assignment, we can actually calculate the cycles it needs to take to do one of the to, like how, how long it takes to for that partition to finish up. So what we want to do is the latency is just adding up all of those latency, but it becomes a mean max problem when we want to find the throughput because we want to figure out the maximum cycle, which means the slowest partition, and we want to minimize that. So in the end, we have this uh, complete mathematical formulation. And next, I'm going to go to talk about our workflow. So in our workflow, we will start with a neural network topology and basically a high level description for that and also a high level description for the systolic array with including some memory bandwidth limit and things. Uh, we fed them into a tool called scale sim, which is a systolic uh, simulator, which help us to build the data set, a cycle accurate data set on what is happening. And after we have that data set, we can basically know given how many resources to each layer, how many cycles they take. So, and then we want to design on a specific, how many partition we want to do in that design. What we can do next is we, follow, we ask the evolution strategy to give us a random layer assignment. After we were receiving a layer assignment, what we want to do is we fed them into a good, greedy, but optimal algorithm. What's happening here is given a layer assignment, we have an approach, a heuristic approach is you add, you always add one resource, one unit of resource to the slowest partition. That way you can actually come up with the best uh, resource assignment according to that layer assignment. And with that too, we can actually use the mathematical formula we just provide to feedback the score to evolution strategy to ask them to generate the next generation of layer assignment. And if we keep looping this, we will just, in the end, we will plateau, we will find the best solution we can be provided. So you may ask, why do all this workflow? So we actually run all of the um, things in a brute force manner, and we just try all the combination, and we, takes, we find out that even at seven partitions, we actually takes five days to compute. And if it is a 15 partitions, it will take an estimate 5,000 years. Definitely, I do not have a really good CPU at home, so if minor, maybe 2,000 years will be good. Um, a step-by-step -step example here is I'm going to go through how the optimization loop is going. So on the left-hand side is the layer assignment, on the right-hand side is the resource assignment. This is the corresponding graph that introduced their partition in per iteration. So the x-axis is actually each iteration. So other than this two graph, we actually also want to introduce a graph is given that layer assignment and resource assignment, what is the throughput gain and the latency penalty at that iteration. So at the very beginning, you can see, because evolution strategy is like 
it start with a random point. So it have really poor latency, they have really high latency penalty than the throughput gain, which is bad, we don't want that. But after this iteration loop for a fuse run, it's actually give us a better, better um, throughput gain and lower latency penalty. And when we just, we basically what we do here is just let it run until it stabilizes and we decide it cannot be improved anymore. So a really interesting point I want to bring to you guys here to look at is that in the first partition, the blue one, actually you have the least amount of layer assigned to it. However, you have the most hardware resource assigned to it. And even when the first partition have the least amount of layer, it's the partition that need the most amounts of resource. So this indicates you cannot just do a naive approach to resolve this core problem. Uh, some of the results, I'm just gonna quickly go through that because I'm running out of time. Uh, so we want to talk about uh, this graph. It's, uh, it's a latency penalty against throughput gain graph. And we only have Google Net here because I don't want to mess up everyone's brain by showing too much data point. And each data point here represents a different partition count. So from the leftmost, it's like two partition, three partition, and you count them all. So I want to draw attention to these two straight lines. These two straight lines actually indicate after a certain partition counts, when you increase your partition, it only give you more latency penalty and not increasing your throughput gain. So those were the actual optimum point we are looking for in this whole paper. So I, we have run this on multiple networks, some of them as from MLPro. And then we have a figure, figure of merits. And the figure of merits is basically a throughput gain over latency penalty. And as we can see, the trend here is the more, the more shallow your network, the more, the less benefit you gain by using this kind of partition. But because like Google Net, it have like 58 layers, it's actually really benefit from doing these kind of partitions. And these are the two extreme points. And AlphaGo Zero is a really, deep, uh, um, really special network that is really hard to parallelize and a lot of layers just not doable. And we want to talk about the competition. So we start from the scaling the cascade paper, which is from a professor. He gave a design, this is really low latency, but like uh, not as high throughput as the super tile one. And super tile basically give us a design that have higher throughput gain with some latency penalty. But with this paper, you can do more design choice. Like you can have a slightly higher throughput gain with more latency penalty, or even a way higher throughput gain, nearly 6,000 image per second with, I, uh, with around two times two times uh, latency penalty. Uh, so the conclusion here is we boost hardware utilization using this kind of partition arrangement. We are 1.4 times higher throughput gain than super tile and two times latency penalty. And these two also allow us to investigate more into how we can do this kind of design. And I think the main contribution of this paper is give us a systematic way on how to do partitioning and improve our performance of systolic array. Uh, thank you everybody, and the whole tool is open source on this URL. Okay, time for one quick question. Yes? Hi. It looked like you assigned um, a multiple layer into one partition. Then there will be a data dependency, and then it will take some time to feed the data, let's say from the bottom back to the top. So that your formation include that latency? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question because there's a actually really important assumption I didn't really mention uh, here is when we do the partitioning, we assume that each partition is on a consecutive order. So we don't have like the 58 layer in the second partition and the second layer at the third partition. Because when the time I'm discussing with my professor, we think that this actually makes you spend more resource to redirect the data flow, which is not actually really fitting the scaling of cascade paper data flow. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Harry.